so I should not be presenting this. Okay. Every time I speak, that little voice pops up in my head. Every time I teach a class, that little voice pops up in my head. Every time I get a new client, that little voice pops up in my head. And it's that voice that says, who do you think you are that you can do this? Right? That voice tells me I'm not enough. I'm not good enough to do this. And that little voice is my fear. Right? Fear that I'm not smart enough. Fear that I'll make a mistake. Um, fear that y'all will judge me. Right? Fear of being found out. And that's imposter syndrome. So I'm not alone in that fear. We've got 70% of successful people, 75% of executive women, 80% of CEOs, 84% of entrepreneurs. They all have felt like imposters. They all feel at some point in their life that they're out of their space. Right? They're operating from vapor. That's a tough feeling. And my name is Dori Kellner. Um, I coach mindfulness for my company, Insightful Culture. I lead the workplace division at Esteemed. I'm co-founder of Sleight of Hand Studios, which is a Drupal agency that we founded almost 20 years ago now. And so I consider this a highly successful professional portfolio, don't you think? Not bad, not bad for a life well lived. Um, so I was curious, how can I still hold on to this fear even when my experience proves that I'm fully capable of doing what I do. So imposter syndrome is this feeling of self-doubt and personal incompetence, and it persists despite your education, your successes, your experiences, your accomplishments. So recently I had to um, renew my Red Cross certification. and. I get to the parking lot and all these butterflies start coming up. And I'm thinking, oh, but I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I, I've been certified in Red Cross before. So I've been through it all. And I did all the studying online that you're supposed to do before you show up. And yet I still ended up in the parking lot going, I should know this. And I'm on my way to a training, to a place where somebody is going to ensure that I know this. Right? What's up with that? Well, we have to always prove that we're capable and worthwhile because we want to gain respect and admiration from other people. And we set our standards for success so high that we just can't attain it. Okay. So this then leads us to that sense of futility, my being in the parking lot with all the butterflies, maybe paralysis over making decisions or moving on with our lives. And sometimes we even just see our successes as luck. We just brush them off. Oh, I was in the right place at the right time. We don't internalize that. We actually earned the success that we have. Okay? And often we try to hide what we don't know. Okay? We don't want anyone else to know that we don't know something um, because we'll be found out. So I am going to play a short video, piece of a short video for you that's going to explain what imposter syndrome is. And then we're going to kind of dive into it and talk about the different kinds of imposters and how we can overcome these fears. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to get this, this playing. Even after writing 11 books and winning several prestigious awards, Maya Angelou couldn't escape the nagging doubt that she hadn't really earned her accomplishments. Albert Einstein experienced something similar. He described himself as an involuntary swindler whose work didn't deserve as much attention as it had received. Accomplishments at the level of Angelou's or Einstein's are rare, but their feeling of fraudulence is extremely common. Why can't so many of us shake feelings that we haven't earned our accomplishments or that our ideas and skills aren't worthy of others' attention? Psychologist Pauline Rose Clance 
was the first to study this unwarranted sense of insecurity. In her work as a therapist, she noticed many of her undergraduate patients shared a concern. Though they had high grades, they didn't believe they deserved their spots at the university. Some even believed their acceptance had been an admissions error. While Clance knew these fears were unfounded, she could also remember feeling the exact same way in graduate school. She and her patients experienced something that goes by a number of names, imposter phenomenon, imposter experience, and imposter syndrome. Together with colleague Suzanne Imes, Clance first studied imposterism in female college students and faculty. Their work established pervasive feelings of fraudulence in this group. Since that first study, the same thing has been established across gender, race, age, and a huge range of occupations, though it may be more prevalent and disproportionately affect the experiences of underrepresented or disadvantaged groups. To call it a syndrome is to downplay how universal it is. It's not a disease or an abnormality, and it isn't necessarily tied to depression, anxiety, or self-esteem. Where do these feelings of fraudulence come from? People who are highly skilled or accomplished tend to think others are just as skilled. This can spiral into feelings that they don't deserve accolades and opportunities over other people. And as Angelou and Einstein experienced, there's often no threshold of accomplishment that puts these feelings to rest. Feelings of imposterism aren't restricted to highly skilled individuals either. Everyone is susceptible to a phenomenon known as pluralistic ignorance, where we each doubt ourselves privately, but believe we're alone in thinking that way because no one else voices their doubts. Since it's tough to really know how hard our peers work, how difficult they find certain tasks, or how much they doubt themselves, there's no easy way to dismiss feelings that we're less capable than the people around us. There's no easy way to dismiss feelings that were less capable of people around us. Did anyone here watch the Oscars? No. No? no. Okay. So Daniel Kwan won an Oscar for screenwriting, Everything Everywhere All at Once. And in his acceptance speech, he said, quote, oh my God, guys, my imposter syndrome is at an all-time high somebody standing on a stage with an Oscar. Okay. So how did we get here in the first place? How did we all end up in a place where we feel like frauds? So maybe you got a message from your family that intelligence is important. You know, did your parents maybe say, oh, you're so smart? We always do that with kids, right? We say, oh, you're so smart. But how often do we say, oh, you really worked hard? But we're giving that sense of value to being smart, okay? And this has a long-term impact on us. You know, maybe we had a need to please in order to get attention to show our accomplishments. Um, maybe we got mis mixed messages about achievement. Maybe we worked in an office that's really competitive. And so asking questions is not really looked upon very highly. So there's also a larger cultural issue at play, as we saw in the video. You know, we think it's better to fake our knowledge than to show our truth. And if you're an outsider or you're part of a marginalized group, this really impacts you quite a lot. But in general, most people would rather just take notes in a meeting instead of speaking up and try to figure out what was said after the fact. <laughs> I, I've been in lots of meetings where, you know, I really had no idea what people were talking about. But I figured I'd figure it out later. I didn't want them to know. <laughs> um, and then social media and technology adds to this expectation as well. You know, you have to portray yourself as happy and successful. And maybe you're unhappy or maybe you're afraid of the future. And so you present this public image that's different than your private persona. Okay? And when you do that, um, it again just reinforces that sense of being a fraud. So you're not really being your true self. So I'm going to flash some experiences on the screen. And you can read each one. I'm going to read them aloud so that they're on the recording as well. And it also gives you an opportunity, if you would like, to close your eyes 
and just see which of these resonate with you. And just like be honest with yourself, which of these things resonate with you. So let's get started. I dismiss positive feedback and compliments and overreact to negative feedback. I hold myself to insanely high standards. I think my success is due to luck. I don't feel that I deserve success or praise. I'm a workaholic. I hold myself to high standards and will do everything possible not to make mistakes. I'm afraid I'll be found out as a fraud. So listed here are some of the thoughts associated with imposter syndrome. And you know, you might have resonated with, with more than one of the concepts that I flashed up um, just now. Imposter syndrome is feeding this fantasy of being, needing to be perfectionists. Okay? It makes you lose perspective about what it takes to feel good about yourself. So there's these two sides. It's like a duality to imposterism. So one is that if you can't meet your perfectionist goals, you feel like a failure. So you're basically your motive is, is to um, you know, avoid failure, right? So in order to reduce the risk of failure, you might work really hard. You might overcompensate. But on the other side, you might also find, think that you know, your success might lead to greater expectations from other people. And Clance stated that imposters feel uncertain about their ability to maintain their current level of performance, so they are reluctant to accept additional responsibilities. So you might worry that if you take on too much, somebody might find out you're phony. And so to reduce the risk of this, you know, you might not want to step out of your comfort zone. You might not want to take that promotion that you're really, you know, capable of doing or going after that new job. So all of this fear, it spirals into anxiety and stress. And you may develop some of these coping habits to manage your anxiety. And you really pay a price for that. You know, you might work too hard, although the overwork, you might turn down opportunities for advancement or to learn new skills. Um, and women are particularly um, find themselves in this situation when uh, there's a, a job listing, you know, and there's 10 items. You need to have these 10 skills. Well, women will look at it and go, I only have three or four of these. I'm not going to apply for that job. And research has shown that men will say, I have three or four of these. I'm going to apply for that job. So, you know, based on, on our own personal experiences, we really can start holding ourselves back. And then on top of that, our coping mechanisms don't align with business objectives either. And so when we hold ourselves back, there's fewer voices in the room, um, there's a lack of innovation, there's team stress because maybe you're procrastinating as you're trying to make your, your work perfect. Um, you're reducing the talent pool. If you're really good and ready for a promotion, but you refuse to take it because you don't think you're ready, then you're limiting your organization's talent. Okay? Um, there are costs from over-preparing, and ultimately there's burnout. All of this stress will lead to burnout. So you're actually holding back yourself and the organization and your coworkers. So we need to get out of this cycle. So I'm going to define imposterism right now as the gap between your actual performance and your ideal standard, <laughs> maybe way up here. So that gap is your imposter syndrome, and it interferes with your ability to accept your achievements, um, to accept that you've done positive things, and then it starts to impact your psychological well-being. And you end up with that burnout, that emotional exhaustion, that loss of motivation. Um, and your achievement might even start to drop because you feel guilt and shame. So then you just start cycling over and over again. And the best way to overcome imposterism is to bring awareness of the narratives to your head. So you carry these stories and patterns throughout your life. And 
what we need to learn is how to detach from them and question our beliefs because that's really the only way that we can reduce imposter syndrome instead of reinforcing it. So the way out is to think differently. Okay? Not trust the thoughts that are currently going through your head. And so there's no magic pill here. And you know, you're not gonna come away from this session and go, hey, I'm cured. But we can turn to what we call mindset theory. And this will help, help you change how you think about your imposterism. Um, mindset theory is a set of ideas based on whether you believe you're born with a fixed set of abilities or you have the ability and the capacity to grow. Okay? And the beliefs that you hold about your own intelligence is what really influences your attitudes and behaviors. So if you believe that your ability is fixed, um, you probably have in your head, I should be able to do that. I should have been able to do that. I shouldn't have gotten that wrong. Lots of shoulds. So if you hear yourself saying should to yourself all the time, maybe you have a, a bit of a fixed mindset. Okay? There's all this black and white thinking. It's either right or it's wrong. Um, you might not um, avail yourself of new learning potentials and opportunities um, because you might equate learning with being imperfect. Hey, I should know it all already, right? Like I was in that parking lot. I should know it all already. And you might want to avoid challenges and obstacles because, you, yeah, you might fail. And people might notice that. So you kind of become a victim of your own mind and you start blaming yourself for your shortcomings. Okay? But if you believe in, in a growth mindset, then you have the potential to develop your abilities. You start thinking, oh, if I have potential, maybe I'll focus more on that. Okay? So challenges and feedback become opportunities for growth. And you can value effort and motivation to learn. So a growth mindset lets you make these small, long-lasting changes about your intelligence that's really going to help you overcome imposter syndrome. Um, you're giving yourself space to be more than what you currently are. And then you'll start to see some success. So when you challenge the negative thought patterns in your head, you start to separate your feelings from the facts. And this is a really important concept because this helps you develop new ways of thinking about yourself. Okay. And your brain is capable of thinking differently. Okay. This is called neuroplasticity. And it's the ability of your brain to develop new neural pathways. So you can start changing your behaviors and habits. Okay. So instead of seeing the way you're behaving as a moral failure, judging yourself, you can start to turn to science and say, ah, this is why I'm thinking this way. And I can make a change. And my brain can adapt to that change. Okay? So we're going to discuss now some very effective ways to change your perspective, no matter what type of imposterism that you're experiencing. And while imposter syndrome never goes away completely, when you change a relationship to how you manage it, then it's going to be a great relief. So we're going to talk about the five types of imposters. Um, Dr. Uh, Valerie Young is the co-founder of the Imposter Syndrome Institute. And she's identified these five types of imposters. And knowing what category you fall in can help you develop the right mindset uh, to manage that type of imposter syndrome. And you may fall into one or more categories. You may fall into all five categories. But I'm going to give you ways of reframing how you feel and think so that your brain can start to change and evolve. So first, who's, a, who's the type A's in here? The type A overachievers, right? Maybe you're a micromanager, maybe you're a control freak. Everything's got to be done your way, okay? If you have a small error, if you got 99 out of 100 on an exam, that was a failure. You don't focus on the 99, you focus on the one. 
right? So you end up either overworking because you have this enormously high bar that you want to reach, or you procrastinate because you're afraid you're never going to reach the high bar. Okay? So perfectionists really don't have a reality-based assessment of, our, of your own capabilities. And honestly, I'm not going to say don't be a perfectionist. Okay? Because I really appreciate people who do good work. And perfectionists really do good work. Um, but you have to remember that you're also slowing down your team. It's not just about you. So I've seen this in the workplace where someone feels like their work has to be so perfect that it comes in three weeks late. I'm sure we've all worked with people whose work comes in consistently late. And in the meantime, project schedules had us working on something else in those three weeks that we came in late. So we just start impacting our work. Everybody else is waiting for us. We're impacting other people's resources. So what we can do to reframe our thoughts and feelings is to say to ourselves, what is the most reasonable amount of effort it will take to get this job done? Okay. So when you get a new task, reframing it as, what's good enough? What's good enough? And so I'm not saying do crappy work. Okay? I'm definitely not saying that. Um, but start to notice where your mind goes to this perfectionism versus what's good enough for the particular job. Okay? So anytime that you have a new project, recognize that it depends. Okay? It depends, and that's going to also depend on what kind of career you have. You know, are you, you know, a, a, in, in tech, are you a neurosurgeon? You know, are you a bus driver? All of that, it depends, is gonna matter on what it is that you're doing and what task is being put in front of you. So, you know, it's gonna depend on the criticality of your work, obviously. But at least start to slow down and say to yourself, it depends. So the next type is the expert, okay? This is the person who expects to know everything. And if I don't know something, I have failed. So you get held back in your career, if you're this type of imposter, because you never feel qualified enough for anything, okay? If you don't know the answer to a question, you feel you're ashamed, right? Um, you always think that you should be reading more books, getting more training, going to more certifications before you go for that job or promotion. So this is really holding ourselves back. Um, so, you know, who was like really at, near the top of their high school class? And then you go off to college and everyone else there is really smart. So you start to doubt your own talent, right? And you begin to pursue all this knowledge. Oh my gosh, I have to catch up. I always have to catch up. I'm never going to get ahead. I'm never going to be better than, than these other people. You know, we're on the Princeton campus right now. That exists there. Right? I went to Cornell. That existed there. And you feel like a failure. And you never feel like you're good enough. So the reframe here is to recognize that you can't possibly know everything. You know, somebody once said you can't ever get to the end of the internet, right? It kind of sounds kind of corny and silly, but it's, it's true. You, the knowledge, you can't have knowledge of everything. And, and in reality, nobody's expecting that of you. Nobody's expecting us to know everything. And so practice saying, I don't know. I don't know. I often get questions at sessions here or sessions I do, you know, webinars that I do, and you know, it takes a lot of bravery to say, you know, I don't know. I don't know, I'll get back to you on that. It takes a lot of bravery to say that to a supervisor, to a manager, to a coworker, even to your kids. I don't know. So that's your, re your reframe. I don't need to know everything, I don't know. And, and as I'm saying these things, it's not, you know, I'm not giving you tons of, of exercises to do. Just to begin to notice, to build your awareness when this sense of imposterism hits you. 
that there are possible ways to reframe, to take a pause, reframe how you're thinking. Okay. Next is the soloist. So this is the person that doubles down on in independence. Um, somebody who will not accept praise if they didn't do it all by themselves. And it takes you longer to complete tasks because you're hesitant to ask for help. And we see this a lot in the tech space where people put their heads down into their laptops and say, I don't need a team. I got this. I can do this all by myself. So if this resonates with you, it's really important to tell yourself that you need to include other people in your work. This is your reframe, okay? Not working in a vacuum. So just like in our use cases, how important is it to go out and talk to a community of people who are gonna use our products, right? And get more voices in the room to help make a better product. Okay? Use cases require that of us, that we talk to lots of people. Okay, and that's what this is about for you. It's about recognizing that there are other perspectives out there and that it's important to include other people, right? So if you start to feel like, you know, I, I'm just putting my head down and I don't care about the rest of the team, that's when you start to say, hey, you know, other people might have another perspective that's important to you. Then we've got the natural genius. And the person who thinks that if it's not easy to do something on the first try, then I must be a failure, right? I must, I must not be any good at it. Why should I even bother to do it? Because I encountered a setback. Setbacks are failures. So these are the folks that really will gain a lot of um, help by moving to from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset, okay? It isn't a failure if you need to work on mastering a task. I believe, as someone once said, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something, okay? So we can't just master a task just because, you know, we try once. That's not sufficient. Okay. So your reframe is to see these challenges as an opportunity to grow. Okay. So if you start on a new project, this is a really good time to practice this reframe. So I recommend you keep a log. So you're starting a new project, keep a log. And in this log, write down, here are all the new terms I'm learning. Here are all the new processes that people want me to use that are different from what I'm used to. Um, here are all the new people I'm working with. Now maybe, you know, we always build teams and dissolve teams and build new teams. Okay, here are all the new people I'm working with. Here, here's how I feel about these people. And then write all this stuff down. This is all new stuff, right? So write it all down. You've done this before. You've gone from one project to the next and you've been perfectly successful, but you haven't internalized it. So you write it down. And then meet with a supervisor, a coworker. It could be your partner, it could be your dog. Meet with someone and talk about it every week. Talk about what you wrote down so that you can see from week to week, hey, I've learned something. I've managed to do that. It's not that hard. Oh, it is difficult, but I can still do it and I can do it well. Right? You're starting to normalize that gap between where you think you should be and where you are. So to say, yeah, you know, I've got this. But writing things down in logs and talking it out with people, it's really helpful because it just gives you this, you know, validation that you've evolved. It's hard to like look back at the end of something and see that we've evolved. But it's what if you keep notes along the way and look back at those notes, then you can really see how, how far you've come. And finally, we have the superhuman. So if you fall short in any role, parent, partner, 
um, at home, at work, oh my gosh, how shameful is that? You should be able to handle it all perfectly and easily, and you have to excel at every single role you play in your life. Um, you may be a people pleaser. You may be somebody who's unable to say no to anything because you should be able to handle everything that comes your way. Do we know people like this? You should be able to handle it all. And you're really setting up yourself for burnout and failure because guess what? Nobody is perfect at all these different roles. And it's unhealthy. So if you're a supervisor and people are reporting to you or you're a parent and you have kiddos, you know, what message are you sending to people if you say you've got to be perfect at everything? This is where a lot of our imposter syndrome came from in the first place. People telling us we need to be perfect at everything. Okay. So you're going to create more imposters, more people who work for you, who look up to you, who respect you. If they think that they have to be perfect at everything because you're perfect at everything, you're going to stress out a whole other generation of people. Okay. So the reframe is really to set some healthy boundaries here, okay? really slowing down and start to delegate things out. You can delegate things to your kids, you can delegate things to your spouse, you can delegate things to other people at work, you can ask for help from your, from your manager, <coughs> say, hey, I've got to get this off my plate. When you do that, it helps other people feel valued. You know, this is particularly, you know, you see this in, in relationships where one partner in the relationship feels they have to do everything there themselves. They are the only one who knows the right way to do it, right? How many people know like the person who says, no, there's one right way to load the dishwasher, <laughs> right? And so you have to start giving other people responsibilities. You think about, is there a way I can delegate this so that other people feel valued? So that's the kicker right there, saying, oh, if I delegate, other people will feel valued. Is that, it's, that is something your brain can latch on to and say, oh, I can, I, can do, I can do that. I can help others instead of having to take it all on yourself. So what else can you do? We went through the five types of imposters, um, but there are some other general things that we can do to help um, us evolve past imposter syndrome. And the first one is to give it a name. It's pervasive, right? Imposterism. When you give something a name, it means you're not alone. Other people <laughs> are experiencing this as well. And you know, Everyone is in this room right now because either they're experiencing it or they have a coworker or a partner or a friend who's experiencing it and you want to help them. And so we all know that this is this is real. So give it a name. Then start talking to people. So like we saw in the um, in the short video that I played, there's pluralistic ignorance. There is this thought that inside our heads that we're the only ones who think this way. So start talking to people, pick a friend. And we're always afraid, you know, we're gonna have a conversation with a friend and they're gonna say something we don't like. Okay, we're all, everyone in this room is, friend, is a friend of somebody, right? Have you ever said to your friend, you should have been able to do that, you're an idiot. We don't say that to our friends and they're not gonna say it back to us, okay? They're not going to say it back. So talk to your friends and, and you know, tell people this is, a way, this is a way to normalize how we're feeling. Hey, do you ever get scared when, you know, I really want to go after this promotion, but I don't, I don't think I have enough um, in my resume to do it. You know, let's, can, can you help me talk through this so I feel strong enough to, to apply for the job? Okay. Friends will do that for you. Don't be afraid of talking to them, right? So right before I started this session, somebody came up to me and they said, you got this. Yeah. And all those nerves and butterflies I was feeling, they just dropped away. It's like, yeah, you're right, I got this. 
I got this. I'm good. So, you know, if friends can reinforce the positive. Right? Now, many of us dismiss the compliments we receive, right? And so this one's a tough one. You think you don't deserve a compliment. And with imposterism, not only you don't deserve a compliment for the work that you've done, but if you did it in a team, you're like, oh no, it was the team. And I know I was a project manager for many, many years, and I never accepted a compliment. Every time there was a compliment, it was like, no, 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 it's my team. And any time there was a failure, oh no, no, it was me. And, and you know, project managers are actually taught to do that. <laughs> and then it starts to impact your psyche. So, you know, maybe not the best, best way to do it. Um, so the next time somebody pays you a compliment, just say thank you. Right? Just, just thank them. Say, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a really tiny little thing. And you have to practice this one because it feels so phony. Right? Doesn't it feel kind of quirky to say, oh, okay, I'm going to tell somebody thank you. It doesn't feel like it's enough, but it is. It's enough. Because what it's doing is changing those neural pathways in your head. So you're starting to accept praise. You're starting to see positive within yourself. That's really changing how your brain operates. Okay. So listen to the words and give that space to really appreciate the accomplishment. Now the other thing I suggest is that you write them down. You store them in a folder someplace. Um, I know people who put them on stickies and put them all over their office, all over their workspace. Next time you start feeling imposterism now, you've got all of these compliments people have given you. Just look at them. Again, starting to reinforce in your brain, you know what, I got this. Okay. And then even if you're not experiencing imposter syndrome, uh, you might have that inner critic in your head. You know, that one that says, you know, you did this wrong, you shouldn't have said that, or you know, why did I say that, you know. Um, we can understand that the inner critic is human. It is, it is, humans aren't perfect. And it's proof of your humanity that you have this self-doubt. That's okay, we're not trying to get rid of being human. Um, but remember, you're a work in progress, and everyone makes mistakes. It's okay to make a mistake. Um, and so start practicing thinking about what's good in your life. So every time you have one of these you know, critical thoughts about yourself, um, take out paper and pen. It's not your laptop, it's not anything electronic, it's not a voice recorder, it's paper and pen. And write down three reasons why you're wrong. Okay. So you have critical thoughts. Three reasons why it's a lie. I can't do this project. Three reasons why that's a lie. Oh, I've taken on new projects before. Oh, I've learned new tech skills before. Three reasons why that's a lie. Okay, and this is going to start to change your bias towards negativity. Again, rewiring your brain to look for more positive aspects of yourself. Okay, and you take this space to say, what else can be true? Okay. So start to quiet your inner critic. And to do a lot of these things, I highly recommend meditation. Um, becoming aware of your breath and body helps you to calm your nervous system. I was meditating out in the hallway before the session started and it gives you space to be more aware that your head is just telling you all these stories. It gives you the space to pause and say, that's not true, why do I think that's true? What else can be true? It really calms your nervous system and you start to see these patterns that are arising in your head and you can start to detach from them. And that's what's needed to do that reframing that I talked about when we discussed the five types of imposters. In order to be able to reframe, you need a little bit of space to pause and detach from the situation that's going on around you. And a meditation practice actually helps you do that. 
So it gives you that space to notice when you're kind of spiraling out of control and to sort of come back into reality and go, wait a minute, I have a reframe for that. Let me use my reframe. And finally, when you believe that you're an imposter, you're sending out signals to others not to trust you. Okay. Why should people trust you if you don't trust yourself? So there's a primal part of your brain called the amygdala. And it gives people the ability to sense each other's trust. You know, you know that when you are talking with somebody, you start to have these feelings about them. You know, it's your brain trying to figure out, you know, how, how am I going to relate to this person? And so if you're picking up these feelings of, of lack of trust, you know, we're subliminally giving out messages. And other people are going to pick them up. So building your self-compassion is really important because as you build your self-compassion then you start releasing your self-judgment okay so qualities of compassion can be cultivated um, so take time out of your day I tell people end of your day reflect on one good thing that happened in that day one good thing about yourself that's all it takes one good thing okay and this helps you open up your connection with other people. So when I hear that little voice in my head, the one that says I'm not enough, I follow three steps. Okay, first, I notice it's happening. Just like I did at the Red Cross Center, just like I did before I came into this session, awareness, I notice it's happening, okay? And that gives me the space to say, why do I believe this? And then I don't listen to this voice. I don't listen anymore. I say, you know, this is why it's not true. I look for evidence, right? The evidence of the good things that happened to me, the successes I've had, the compliments I've received, all the things that I'm writing down and storing away. Because this little voice in your head, you know, it's self-doubt. And Sharon Salzberg, who's a meditation teacher, she said, give it a name. Give your inner critic a name. And it's so funny because somebody in a session the other day said to me, my, my inner critic, I call him Jamal. And I say, Jamal, go in the corner there, have a cup of tea, I got this. So you're just like telling yourself doubt, I got this, go away from me right now. I don't need to listen to you. And then take action, okay? There are consequences to listening to that little voice, you know, and you want to maintain that growth mindset to turn your challenges into opportunities to be positive and human, to be able to say, I made a mistake, I had a misstep, it's okay, I'm gonna learn from it. You've gotta act. You've gotta trust yourself and act. You've gotta be able to say, I can do this and re reinforce those connections in your brain over and over again. So, are there any questions? Covered a lot of material today, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them now. So, you're welcome to reach out to me at any time. Here's my contact info, I've got some cards up here. Um, I am a um, mindfulness facilitator and a well-being facilitator in the workplace. Um, and I manage the workplace um, division at Esteemed. Uh, if you don't know Esteemed, where uh, we provide a community for digital independence who, you know, maybe you don't have a workspace, you're on your own, um, you're working remotely, and you need a community, community to help you grow and develop your career. And so we're there to help you do that. We also, of course, um, do um, talent sourcing and, and job placement. So um, we, I do a weekly session 
Uh, I don't present like this, but we have a collective in the room, a collective of wisdom. People come in on Zoom, and uh, I start off a topic to facilitate on uh, self-growth and um, personal development and career development. So if you're interested in, in joining that, um, let me know. I have um, cards here as well for esteemed, and uh, you're welcome to join the colleagues community. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate the, the courage it took to come into a session like this in a tech conference. And uh, I wish you a great conference. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.